Hello slimy furtlers and uh, today we're going to do a bit of something uh, slightly different uh, instead of doing a car or you know a gas lands conversion uh, I'm going to actually be doing this which is a uh, model kit and it's a model kit of a Panzer 4G I don't know if you can see there the Panzer 4G can't, there we go yeah Panzer 4G um, I think this is armor fast. Yeah, it's armor. It's armor fast. Uh, the armor fast. Guy. Armor fast are a really good company for selling uh, one uh, one seventy second scale um, vehicles and, and stuff like that. You know, uh, they usually come in packs of two. Uh, but the guy I buy these off seems to have a lot of them, and he splits them up into you know one model and uh, sells them individually which is good because sometimes you don't want two you just want one and I just want one so we've got here the mission thing is put it in a nice little ziplock baggy and get it open oh I'm all fingers and thumbs today so yeah we've got the instructions which are nice and simple uh, the armor fast stuff is is really nicely it's, it's it's got enough detail on it to make it uh, you know not cheap and nasty like you get some of the you know sort of cheap stuff and if you buy them in packs of two I think the retail price on a uh, you know an arm fast basically they come in a box and uh, the a box is anywhere between 10 and 15 quid depending on what sort of vehicle it is you're getting you know like some of the larger Russian tanks I think uh, kind of retail at about you know towards 15 pounds um, but the smaller ones, um, you know, more towards ten pounds sort of thing. But yeah, that's the that's the sprue. Uh, just got a thing on here. Yeah, it just says Armour Fast, made in England, copyright two thousand and eleven. And as you can see, it's very simple to put together sprue. Uh, there's got a lot of nice detail on there. There's little bits in there for you to add aerials and stuff like that on. But what we're going to do is, uh, I'm just going to go through and, and make this. Um, where are we? I need my clippers. Oh. I need my clippers, there's my clippers, I'm going to need a sharp knife, so I've got my little box of tricks here and I've got two sharp knives in here, uh, there's thing there, so I'm going to need a thing, I'm going to need my scalpel and I'm going to need my uh, plastic glue or whatever it's called, I can't remember what it is. Uh, poly, poly something cement, there it is. Uh, I've got some Revel, Revel Contactor Professional. Now, uh, yeah. yeah, liquid glue for plastics. Um, it doesn't say what sort of glue it is, but it's plastic glue, so I will think, uh, yeah, it is. It's whatever it was cement polystyrene cement or whatever I'll just check this because one of the great things about having these needle applicators is is like yeah you can put a little bit where you want it unfortunately the needle applicators do tend to get blocked up but if it's blocked up I'll show you how the best way is to uh, get them unblocked and it doesn't involve poking and everything it's, uh, it's a very simple process so we're just gonna start with the uh, the instructions here and uh, let's have a look what we got so I want the tub for the bottom, so I'll just clip that off. Clip the tub off, and uh, then I want the top armour. I'm obviously not going to record me doing all of this. Just uh, recording starting off because... Um, Obviously I'm going to paint it and everything as well. So we'll just clip the, the bottom tub and the top off. So we'll just, just trim off the flashing that's there. And it will say like, don't do that with a knife because and things, you make gouges in it. If you're careful, you don't make gouges. If you do make gouges in it, then that's not too bad because you can then disguise them as like scrapes and things like that because uh, tanks do tend to get into a whole lot of scrapes. I'll just trim these bits off the tub. There we go. And on here. So what we got that goes on the back of the tub? A rear plate, which is this one, I think. Is that it? Yes, that's the one. Well, it's the only one that's shaped like it, so it must be it. That's one of the problems with 
simple instructions like this because the parts aren't numbered or anything sometimes you'll be like is that that or is that and then you just sort of have to you know wing it <clears throat> just play it by by eye as long as you don't glue anything on and then suddenly realize oh shit that wasn't the right bit um you're fine but you know uh, so i'll just trim that off there and I'm not sure whether that will need filing. I might need filing. Oh no, no, it came off quite easily. Lovely jubbly. So yeah, the, the weird thing about this is, is that I've got lots of 172 model tanks. You know, for starting from, you know, the kind of very first tanks. You know, of the of the First World War right through to the uh, to modern day stuff. And. One of the World War Two era tanks, even though it was one of the most ubiquitous tanks, uh, you know, used during World War Two, uh, was the Panzer IV, and uh, it's taken me absolutely ages to find a Panzer IV in one seventy two one seventy two scale that has been both decent looking and a reasonable price. Um, you know, I know Airfix make a Panzer IV and uh, stuff like that, but some when you look at the the things there in some model shops, especially with postage concerned, um, when postage comes into it and stuff like that, we don't have a model shop around here anymore, which is a, a shame. That was even before the you know the the <coughs> the, uh, the Wu Tang flu decided to uh, pay us all a visit. But the, uh, the our, our, you know, the model shop that we had basically uh, disappeared. <sighs> right now, I've got to try and remember which way around that goes. Uh, I think the fans got there's some supposedly some yeah there's supposedly some grooves on the side for you to guide the, uh, the things in you know to help you put it together. But uh, alas, uh, oh wait a minute. Alas, it appears that there was some sort of design change because the grooves aren't anything, don't look anything like they do in the picture, and the method for attaching them uh, isn't anything like I would thought. I think it would be. I'm just gonna have to just pop that on there, and then that should, in theory, line up with that. So this is one of the things where you have to do kind of trial and error. Uh, yeah, that yeah, yeah, that lines up with that. So if I put this back plate on first, oh, just need to trim a little bit off there, a bit more. If I put this back plate on first, now let's see if this glue has. I don't think just scrape the crusty bits off the end. A little bit down here, and as I'm squeezing it. The, oh, there's a little bit coming out. There we go. Oh, you don't get to see my magic method for unblocking the needle of a uh, unblocking the needle of of one of these things, um, which is very simple. Really, it just involves pulling the needle out and then holding it. Well, well, while holding it with a pair of pliers or a pair of tweezers, you just run a a lighter up and down it until it glows and the glue inside will uh, ignite. Um, not something you want to do over your best um, tablecloth because sometimes the burning liquid glue can squirt out and cause all sorts of unpleasantness. Um, but also sometimes because uh, you don't want to get any of the glue on yourself. Right, so I've stuck that in, and now I've got to put this in, and it won't line up again. Why won't it line up? Why won't it line up? Because that basically track goes in there like that. And in fact, if I put this cover plate on the top, yeah, that should line up with this. Yeah, that should line up with the uh, the armored tub. Do you know, I think I might actually put the armored tub on first, and then oh, hang on. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, yeah, hold it. I'm going to put the. Uh, I'm going to put the bottom of the tub on first, rather than doing the tracks and then bringing it all together. I'm going to put the tub, the tub on. So uh, yeah, 
So anyway, those, for, for those that don't know, the Panzer IV, uh, well, basically, when World War II started, the Germans mostly used uh, Panzer IIs and Panzer III's. And the Panzer III was intended to be the vehicle that they used for knocking out enemy tanks, and the Panzer II was what they used for dealing with personnel, even though the Panzer II was already kind of outdated by the time World War II started. Um, you know, most of the Panzer IIs were only armed with a machine guns or maybe a light cannon of some description. Uh, but the Panzer III uh, was usually armed with some sort of um, dedicated, it was a kind of a dedicated anti-tank platform kind of thing. And uh, oh, there's a bit of a casting casting error there, there's a piece of the uh, front mud track guard sheared off which uh, was nothing to do with me thank god and didn't break it uh, yeah so as the as the war went on it turns out that you know things like the, the British Matilda 2 and things like that were more than capable of knocking out Panzer 3's they uh, they weren't very good uh, compared to some of the British British tanks but the British tanks also had their, their problems um, as in they uh, when they tangled, like when the Germans tangled with the the French, you know, French tanks were quite um, robust, and uh, but they weren't led very well, and they weren't uh, used very tactically in a very tactically astute manner. <coughs> um, the French had decent tanks; it's just that they didn't know how to use them properly, and uh, so the Germans managed to beat them. But then. Uh, when they introduced the Panzer IV, the Panzer IV was supposed to back up the Panzer III by being an anti-personnel tank, basically taking over the role of the Panzer Panzer II. And uh, the as as a it was rather a strange choice because the Panzer II. Am I doing this the wrong way? Yeah, it was rather a strange choice because the Panzer II. Uh, uh, sorry, the the Panzer IV was a much more heavily armoured tank. Um, it could withstand a fair a fair belting from um, you know anti-tank guns. Basically it's, if it was getting hit by six pounder um, you know six pounder guns then uh, it wasn't going to last very long but uh, anything you know like a two pounder or something like that wasn't oh, fuck's sakes yeah, anything like a two pounder or something like that, um, Panzer III could shrug off. But you know, when when six pounders started coming, you know, when the British started fielding, you know, six pounder and twelve pounder um, anti tank guns, uh, the Germans were sort of at a bit of disadvantage using the uh, the Panzer III as a an anti tank vehicle. Um, so what well, was a series of design changes to the Panzer IV because some Bright Spark somewhere realised that using a heavily armoured tank to attack troops while the lighter armoured tank went for the tanks <clears throat> was a bit of a silly idea. And uh, <clears throat> they up armoured the, the original Panzer IVs and they got uh, what the British referred to as a Panzer IV Special which was the Panzer IV F2. Uh, which had a long um, anti-tank gun on it, and the Panzer IV F1 had a, an anti-personnel howitzer on it. Um, Panzer III still stayed in service with the Germans right up until the end of the war. In certain things, they were used as mainly light light tanks or support tanks. You know, they'd be equipped with faster firing guns, or they get um, anti-personnel guns or, or rapid fire cannon sort of thing. Uh, but they uh, uh, the the Panzer IV went through no, numerous changes over the course of the war. Um, so like I said, they started off with the uh, you know basically the Panzer IV A, and by the end of the war they were up to the Panzer IV J. Uh, this particular model is a Panzer IV G, which is the one that came after the the F2, and uh, it was equipped with a uh, very uh, powerful. So look there, it was oh, it was, it was equipped basically with roughly the same gun as the Panzer IV F2, but it had increased armor on it uh, with uh, you know total frontal armor of three and a quarter inches 
and uh, you know armor armor increase well the armor was increased by 30 millimeters all around uh, the front armor was up to about 80 millimeters which like I say is about three and a quarter inches and uh, it uh, it did well but you know obviously then then later on you know it uh, other things had to be done about it you know uh, <clears throat> basically there was problems problems popped up you know it's one of those things where you know you think you've solved a problem and then another problem pops up uh, so they had to constantly keep updating the the tanks to to keep them kind of competitive you know they've got a chassis that was quite reliable and, and useful and basically led to the um, the Panzer IV becoming what we would now call a main battle tank which was like the main tank of the you know the main tank that the army used and then all the stuff like the the later you know panther and tiger tanks sort of came along and they were they although you know they had entire you know like tank groups or tank regiments equipped with panthers and tigers um they they were never as numerous as as panzer fours and uh you know, they were never as numerous as Panzer IVs. Uh, they were more considered kind of, I don't know what you would say, sort of specialist or elite tanks or something like that. Um, because obviously a a Panther tank was a significant improvement. Or well, it's debatable whether it was or wasn't a significant improvement over the Panzer IV. Um, you know, it had the sloped armor thing going off. Whereas, as you can see at this point, the world Panzer IV is still using. You know, big slab sides of armor. You know, the the Tiger, the the original. You know, the Tiger One. Uh, well, Panzer Panzer Six Tiger, uh, the Panzer One, uh, the, the Tiger One. Sorry, um, didn't feature sloped armor, but then that came along with the um, the Tiger Two, which was a lot bigger and in some cases a lot sillier than the uh, than the Panzer. The the, the, the Panthers. You know, they they weren't as much thing there, so they just carried on. The Germans carried on making Panzer IVs right up till the end of war, and then even, Panzer IVs even continued serving after the war with uh, you know with other armies. Now, why won't that bit go in there where it's supposed to? It's supposed to go in. It's supposed to go in there. It's a rear rear plate for this thing here, and uh, when I put it on, it overlaps. So, is that supposed to overlap or something? I, I just I just don't know. Uh, there is another piece there, so if I put the other piece in, maybe that will help me. Maybe that will help me figure out why it's not going in there. Uh, which way around are we going? Which way around are we going? No, that can't be the right part. Nope, that's not. That's not. Uh, well, it's the only one that looks like it, so it therefore must be. In a way, that's a good thing that it doesn't really properly tell you which parts go where. Well, it, it you know which number sort of thing goes here. It just gives you a picture for you to work from, and uh, because you know it means you've got to try and figure it out yourself. But, uh, yeah. So while I'm sorting this one out, I uh, will I'll finish doing this piece, and then hopefully when we come back, the entire thing will be assembled. And we can start doing the painting. Moments later. Right, so there we are. It's it's basically 99% assembled now. Uh, the only other little bits to put on are things like uh, headlamps and and little bits like that, which uh, you know I'll, I'll do. But you know this is the main body of it done. And uh, yeah, it's not a, not a bad little build. Um, problem problems I did have is is like I say earlier with the. Um, with these simple instructions that uh, for example the exhaust thing at the back the exhaust pipe if you want to call it that on the back um, doesn't appear anywhere in in the instructions so I was kind of what am I supposed to do with this and uh, you know I had to, I looked at I had to look at a picture and uh, yeah that's that's where it seems to go on uh, and upon a Panzer IV so yeah it's uh, it's strange uh, as well as that, and this is this is another funny thing, the pin to uh, attach, you know, basically the pin to attach the turret securely to the body, uh, that's not included either. That is actually a separate part that you have to cut off the sprue and, and glue in. 
and then wait a while and uh, you know then you can put it together like that um, there's also a diagram of the uh, the whole mounted machine gun uh, which you know on on the front here we've got the the little ball um, with a hole cut in it uh, I'm, I haven't been able to find a part for that in the sprue so I'm presuming I'll have to uh, make one of those myself which is no problem uh, the uh, as well as there, the, the coaxial machine gun on the uh, the main gun it's shown in the picture there is a a hole for it there but no it doesn't make an appearance on the actual tank itself so mm, it would be helpful if they didn't do you know kind of like mold changes or running changes and uh, you know, didn't update the instructions as well. Like that, I mean, normally, you know, I. It's like I said, there. It's <clears throat> the the thing about you know model making stuff like that is you know sometimes guessing at where things go and uh, what bits are supposed to go where and all stuff like that. Um, you know, that's part of the. I'm going to say the fun of it. Um, another bit was the uh, what they call it the bin for the back of the turret doesn't fit on particularly well. Uh, not quite sure why why that thing. It seems to be like a bin for a different shaped turret. It's uh, but I managed to get it on there, and uh, I'll have to use some filler, obviously, to fill in that gap because we can't have big gaps on tanks. That's just naughty. Um, but yeah, the so yeah, that's the basic uh, build of the Panzer IV G done. Um, as you can see here, we've got the the gun, which, uh, like I said earlier, is based more or less the same gun as what will be on the. Uh, Panzer IV F2, uh, except this one was longer. It was basically it was a new gun, but along the the same kind of lines. It was a longer a longer barrel, and uh, you know they'd made improvements to the gun that they put on the F2. Uh, the Panzer IV G was also one that uh, you could quite often see with um, what they call Schurzen, uh, which were basically panels, metal panels put over the sides uh, to represent side skits. I might actually make some of those. Uh, for it, there was another another one which showed you uh, where I found a picture of a Panzer IV G uh, with a um, a ring around the turret, which was basically spaced armor. Um, I won't make one of those for this, uh, I don't think. But uh, I'll, I will have. I think I might have a go at making the uh, the side skirts for it, and obviously we'll put some little bits of stuff on the front here and things like that. Like I say, I've got some. Some headlamps and you know basically lamps and, and little bits of greeble to put on some of these flat surfaces that are still on the sprue. But yeah, um, so while I'm doing that, I'll also decide um, what paint scheme I'm going to use on it. Um, hopefully, I'll pick a, a decent one and it won't just be boring Panzer Grey. Uh, although I'm not quite sure whether they, they actually did this late in the war, left some Panzer Grey early in the war. They did have Panzer Grey on some vehicles, but. Uh, Late on in the war, they, they they quite like to camouflage things a lot because obviously, even a little bit of camouflage goes a long way. And to be fair, it's really hard to camouflage something massive like this, you know, unless you're hiding it in some, you know, unless you're hiding it in some woods and you've got the camo netting over it and branches and stuff like that. You've got some bushes in front of it, or you know, you're hiding behind a, a low wall and then you've got something over the top to break up the shape of the turret and everything. Uh, speaking of the turret, one of the other improvements that was made to the Panzer IV G was this little uh, commander's uh, cupola or cupola. I call it a cupola because because that's just what I do. Um, yeah, the, the 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 Panzer IVs that came before just had kind of a double a double door in the top, and the commander would you know knock them open, stick his head out, and have a look around. Uh, and in a lot of cases, probably would get shot while doing it. Whereas the Capola was kind of quite thick and uh, it had double a little round hatch on the top instead of a square hatch like the older ones and um, if I remember rightly some of them did have optics built into the Capola so if needs be the commander wouldn't have to stick his head out he could just sort of like stick his head up you know from the turret into the Capola and then just look and there'd be you know like a little binoculars or you know a little rangefinder or something like that in it uh, you know, so you could have a, a look around. Uh, one of the things I also did as well was I drilled out the hole in the end of the gun uh, because that wasn't there and uh, you, you can't really put shells through a 75mm gun uh, without a hole in the end of it. Uh, so yeah, there we go. Uh, while I'm deciding what I'm going to do with the Schurzen, 
uh, Shkurzen, Shurzen, I'm not quite sure how it's pronounced. Um, while I'm deciding what I'm going to do with them, I'll also decide what colour to do it. Uh, and also finish off putting the little bits of grill on to make it look nice. So, uh, yeah, this build's going quite nicely. Six and a half hours later. Yeah, um, finished putting it all together and greebling it up. I just put on the little headlights there and the <coughs> spare wheels in there. And uh, I also made a little machine gun, don't know whether you can see it. Just basically a paper clip glued into there and then cut to length. I also put a radio aerial in the radio socket at the side and then bent it back because um, they obviously the, the aerials that were on the sides of the tanks weren't rigid. Uh, because that was sticking up, it would basically the, it would stop the turret from being able to turn properly like this. So what usually happened with radio aerials was they were, you know, either bent back and uh, strapped down kind of thing. Um, I've just put this one there. Um, may bend it a little further and just put it as strapped to the side kind of thing. Um, but it does need a, an aerial on it because uh, you know tanks are supposed to have radio. Well, German tanks had radios in them, so you know everybody knew what they were doing and didn't just drive around blind hoping that the you know the troop commander would uh, you know tell them you know all right everybody go over here and you know whatever with hand signals you know they did it by radio so yeah Panzer 4G ready to be painted uh, we'll get painting uh, well now I suppose a few moments later aha there we go right <clears throat> here's what we've done with with regards to painting so far I uh, kind of looked at the footage I shot earlier and uh, it's getting a bit long-winded, so I don't want to uh, don't want to spend too much time uh, doing this. So we've got basically what I've done here is I've shown you I'm showing you what uh, the base starts. So I grey primer to, to start off with, and then I gave the entire thing a coat of um, Brooklyn's green, Rover Brooklyn's green, to start off with the, the the kind of green base coat sort of thing. And then what we're doing on top of that is, like I've done with the turret here, I'm dry brushing, uh, well I'm using a combination of dry brushing and um, sponging on uh, white for the kind of, uh, you know, kind of snow camo sort of thing. And uh, this is what uh, a lot of tank crews did, uh, especially being as that a lot of these, uh, a lot of these tanks saw a lot of action in Russia. And as we know, Russia is... Uh, it's very snowy at certain parts of the year in fact quite a lot of the year depending on which part of russia you're in or which part of the soviet union you're in rather should i say and um yeah so it, it basically I'm, I'm sponging it on the uh, i'm going to do the same thing with the the main body uh apart from the the tracks and uh, a few little other bits that uh, are going to get be getting painted you know not white and uh, then I'm going to make some little extra bits, you know, just stuff to greeble it up more than the greeble that, I, that uh, was provided. And uh, yeah, then when, when it comes out, it'll be a kind of, you know, uh, Arctic camo, you know, tank that took part in um, sort of like the round about the time of Operation Zitadel, uh, or maybe even Bar Operation Barbarossa, because a lot of the, the stuff was snow camoed uh, in Barbarossa, although I don't think the... Uh, if I'm, I'm not quite sure the period that this is in, I'm not quite sure whether four Gs took part in Barbarossa. I think Barbarossa was a bit too early for the four G. Uh, maybe the four F or maybe even a few four Ds that uh, turned up for for Barbarossa. But the um, until the the Nazis got sent packing from the Soviet Union, there would have certainly been four Gs and. Uh, uh, for for H's and and right through to uh, I would have said right through to J four J's but I think the four J's were um, a lot later after the, uh, the the Nazis had been sent running back to Germany so uh, yeah that's where we are at the moment with painting um, I'm not going to show you sped up footage or anything I've been painting because it, it is quite literally just me dabbing on white paint and it's not terribly fun to watch. So yeah, I'll be back. When I come back, hopefully the, the full paint will be done and it'll be ready and, and all sorted and, and finalised. So yeah. Three hours later. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <clears throat> I'm calling this one finished uh, for the time being. I'm plenty... Uh, I haven't put any lacquer or anything on it um, yet. I might get around to doing that later, but mm, it won't change how it looks. So, uh, yeah, just mm, let's have a look. Uh, see if we can bring it up a little bit closer for you to see. 
You can see there I've dirtied all the white, nice white camo up with uh, some brown paint, uh, which, you know, Russia in winter is a very snowy, slushy and muddy place. And, uh, you know, so that's what the Germans sort of found out when uh, they, didn't, uh, they didn't get to where they wanted to get to um, by the time that uh, summer was over. Uh, they they ended up having to uh, sit in the places like the uh, Pripyat marshes and the steps and things like that which got covered in snow and uh, thus when they were driving the tanks and stuff about the mud and everything was getting everywhere and the Russians just sort of sat back and laughed at them and then attacked them in T-34s um, yeah so that's the that's that's the one there um, bits extra bits that I've put on it I uh, found a little 172 stowage kit in one of my bits boxes uh, so I'll put on a uh, you know, a tow cable and uh, a couple of shovels and a pick, and uh, then we've got the, the spare wheels there. It's uh, like I said, I've tried to go. I've tried to uh, what the car. I haven't made gloopy mud. I mean, gloopy mud. You know, anybody who knows a gloopy mud trick, it's uh, PVA glue uh, mixed with some sand, and then <coughs> you uh, put some brown paint in, mix it all together, make sure the brown paint is to your particular taste, and then you just slap it on, and you get mud splatters and you know actual 3d multiplier. I haven't made any for this because uh, I just couldn't be bothered <laughs> but yeah um, so yeah that's the, the the aerial that I put on I bent it down I didn't bother bending it back anymore because as you can see the turret can turn fully without really needing to to strap it down anymore uh, the turret still comes off um, the turret still comes off you can see under there I just left that white because you know you can't see that on a tank the only, t the only time you can see the uh, the you know the turret ring on a tank is when it's had its uh, turret blown off and this hasn't had its turret blown off yet uh, oh yeah and then I just found I've got some um, obviously armor, uh, the armor fast things don't come with decals so uh, I just used some decals that I uh, had left over from something else and uh, gave me number 37 in yellow uh, I haven't put any Balkan crosses on or Balkan Kreutz uh, a because there was nowhere really to put them, and B because uh, well, Balkan Kreutzers are usually kind of white on a, a sort of black background, and uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't look very good. The only real place I could think of putting them was like here on the side, but then I splattered mud all over it. So you know, hey, but yeah, that's a Panzer 4G, and uh, kind of served in the the uh, you know with the, both the Wehrmacht uh, or the German here. Uh, and uh, also in certain Waffen SS units um, for well, basically from from kind of 1940 through uh, 1941, I think it was 1941 until the end of the war in in some things. And uh, they made about 3,000. Well, hang on, let me think. Uh, yeah, they, yeah, I think like 3,000 in the first year that they were produced, and then in the second year they made about three and a half thousand but then they also started changing over to the uh, Panzer IV H. Um, I didn't make any Scherzen either because when I looked I uh, didn't have the stuff that I really needed to make some decent Scherzen for it so uh, it's just bare, bare unprotected at the side so uh, you know some Russian can come running up and you know stick a magnetic mine to the side or you know hit it in the side with an anti-tank gun or something like that but yeah so there we are so uh done and uh if you made it this far thank you for watching uh you know comment like subscribe and all that also pop over to my facebook page which will be uh in the end end card and it's also a link's also listed below and uh i'll take some better uh close-up photos and they will follow um well now basically <laughs>